know how long has the jury been out? It's only been a half hour now. Actually, when I started drinking was about 13 years old, so it was about, about four 12, years. I was about 12 years old I when I started drinking. drank and used to die. And I guess I, I kind of rebelled. The same age. I was about 12 years old when I started my Probably life. trying to fit in. That's when I started to drink. Started smoking cigarettes, started drinking, started smoking weed. Hi, my name is John, and I'm an alcoholic. I found marijuana, and subsequently after that, I found alcohol, and I was about 12 years old. I was about 12 years old when I started drinking. 13 years old. About 13 years old, so it was about four years that I had drank and used to die. If you start using after the age of 21, you have a much lower probability of becoming an addict than if you started at 14 or 10 or 12. So one of the things is early usage. But I used to drink beer with my dad sometimes when we'd watch football games. And until about the time I was, you know, I don't know, 13, 12, 13 years old. And then I had some other buddies. And we used to go out and drink all, hmm, almost every weekend. And I guess I kind of rebelled, um, probably trying to fit in. That's when I started to drink. So you're shy. And when you get in uh, a social environment, you tend not to open up, you don't interact with people. But when I take alcohol, not only does it give me this surge of euphoria, but it makes me friendly. It makes me the hit of the party. Everybody thinks I'm funny. I'm doing crazy stuff. I jump up on the table and throw food at people. And, and uh, my friends think that's great. And he says, this go over, see what's going on. There's going to be beer there. There's going to be women there. They're going to have a great time. I said, yeah, why not? Alcohol addiction results from the fact that initially it's perceived as being pleasurable. I thought, well, why not just have a beer or two? What can it hurt? A little social event, no problem. And so I, uh, I took my first drink at 13. And what was amazing to me, from the first time up, I couldn't believe the feelings I had. And I knew right from the beginning that something was different, that, that I wasn't like my peers. I drank extensively. I mean, when it came time to go to school and put it down, I, I couldn't put it down. I mean, I've always, I knew right from, the, right from the get that I was an alcoholic. The research says that anybody can become an alcoholic. Uh, you are addicted or you're abusing when using a substance of any type interferes with your life. The drug does affect the frontal lobe, you know, it lowers inhibition and that sort of stuff. But when it becomes dependence, we're talking about the brain stem, we're talking about the primitive brain, we're talking about food, sex, that sort of stuff. And, and the drug use becomes about survival. It becomes a feeling of, I must have this more than I need this, it is I must have this in order to survive. Eventually it got so bad. My mother housed me for a while and then kicked me out. Uh, so I was living in my car. Uh, it was a nice car though, it was a 66 GTR. It was really a nice car, an old muscle car. Wished I had it now. Once I started drinking, I could not stop and I was hiding it from friends, from family. Um, I really didn't go out of the house unless people were going to be using drugs or drinking, and nothing was fun unless I was drunk. You have a love affair with your substance instead of with people and instead of progressing and, and you know, moving on, uh, finding happiness in your life. And I'd feel so bad about myself that I couldn't even go home, and I'd be drunk for three, four days at a time just day and night. I stayed across the street from the liquor store and I was so bad off, I couldn't go across the street to the liquor store, I'd have to have them deliver. 
And when they delivered, they'd deliver cases of booze to me. You know, if you hurt, you want to feel better. You know, it's natural. If you touch, if you touch one of your hot lights, you pull your finger away. You don't like it to burn. And alcohol takes the burn away. People just want to feel better. And it's not, I don't think that in itself is the problem. It's that we haven't integrated it in a way that, that um, uh, furthers our well-being. It just makes, it makes us sicker, the way we do our consciousness changing. So now you're drinking not only in the evening, but you're drinking in the morning. And then maybe that drink doesn't get you through the day either. And so for lunchtime, you sneak out and get a drink. So here you're drinking multiple drinks all the way through the day. Well, the brain gets used to this. You've done it over and over and over again, and now the brain expects it. It gets pretty bad when your breakfast is booze, and your lunch is booze, and your dinner is booze. You have to come to grips with the fact that you're an addict, and nobody wants to believe that when they first start. Everybody wants to say, oh, he's the drug addict, or, or I'm not an addict, I'm just messing around, or I'm going through a phase right now. I'm not an addict, I can quit any time. Those are the typical, uh, mindset of, of an early somebody in early addiction so the very first step is you have to tell yourself I am an addict this is something I'm gonna be for the rest of my life this is something I'm always gonna be in and something I'm gonna have to deal with I knew that I had to do something I mean I couldn't live like that it was kinda like you know a power greater than me whispered in my ear and said hey you know this is time to change I started going to the therapy, and she told me I had a drinking problem, because I didn't know. Um, and she told me I could either go into, you know, like one of those Highland Ridge or one of those programs, or I could go to AA. And what that is, is non-professionals getting together using some format for discussion to share their experiences and support each other and try to help people out of whatever their problem is. You go up and you say, my name is Teresa Martinez or whatever, right? And I'm an alcoholic. And there's something really uplifting about being honest, finally. Have you guys heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? What do you what do you know about it? What have you heard about it? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> I don't really know anything about it. What have you heard about it? Alcoholic, isn't it? It's just like to cope with if you're, if you're an alcoholic or something, you go there to get therapy. Yeah, I don't like them. I don't like the people that go to them. They're all these. Oh, well, you know, I'm an alcoholic, and hi, so and so. It's 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 irritating, is what it is. It sucked. You know, it sucked. I didn't want to be there. It, it blowed. I, you know, here's a man that's been drinking and drugging for over 30 years. Uh, it sucked, you know, to sit around and listen to these people all whine about the same old stuff happening the same old way. You know, I thought it blew. And I used to get up in a meeting and say, you know what, you guys all suck. This blows. And I'd head right out of a meeting and go get drunk, you know. From the moment I got into the 12 steps, I believed in it. I believed in AA, I believed in, in, into the process. Because you have to read the book and you have to follow the steps and I don't have time for that shit. I, I do things my own way. In AA, they get treated as equals. They get valued as a person. And I think that's part of what makes AA so powerful. It was hokey to me. The greetings, the chanting, and the... And the Hi, my name is Sid, I'm an alcoholic, you know. I, I really didn't like to say that. I've already admitted it, I've already worked through it. I, I don't, every time I go to a meeting, I don't want to have to say that, you know. And the interesting thing about treatment centers is in AA, all they talk about is their substance abuse history and, and introduce themselves as, Hi Joe, I'm an alcoholic. 
first thing we try to do is to get people to quit referring to themselves as that. And has, I've had a change of heart. I enjoy the meetings. I, I mean, I love AA. I love the meetings. I love the people in it. God, I didn't think there was life. You know, without, without beer or drugs or alcohol, I didn't think there was life. But there is. There is. And, and I love it. I mean, it's just marvelous. It's a marvelous way of life. I have 16 and a half years of sobriety, and I owe it all to AA. I've never seen any problems coming out of AA. I've never seen it hurt anybody. I've always seen it help. My experience with AA was kind of, in my opinion, I felt it was a little cultish. No, I wouldn't say it's a cult. I think it's another religion. Alcoholics Anonymous is Christian-based. It doesn't have any requirement. There's atheist AA meetings. Religion is a major factor. It steps second, the second, third, and fourth is spiritual. Now, the way AA does it is they say, God of your higher power. They don't want to be specific. But for me, I was grown up, I grew up LDS, so I fall back on my LDS religion. It's a God thing. It's a God program. It's spiritual. Well, they don't do certain Christian activities like, you know, rosaries or, or Eucharist or sacrament or any of that, but they have their rituals. You know, their drunkologues and their introductions and, and, and I'm not knocking AA. I think it's been supportive for lots of people over, you know, 80 years now. It just is not a treatment model. If an individual is not ready to, to, to change and not ready to give the stuff up, it doesn't matter how many people are pushing them into therapy, it's not going to work. Alcoholics Anonymous does work, but you got to want it. You gotta want it more than anything in your whole life. I think it works for some people. I mean, one of the things that you learn as a teacher is that not everybody learns the same way. I mean, some of the stuff that I use in my classroom, people love it. And some people, it just doesn't go well with them. So, the lesson of that is, AA's great, but it's not great for everybody. And there should be lots of different choices for people. I think that there are ways that people can heal themselves and they don't have to go to AA. So how do you treat an alcoholic? How do you get them to stay off of alcohol for the rest of their lives? The literature has demonstrated very clearly that the most effective form of treatment for substance abuse is cognitive behavioral therapy. What you do in your life is basically a product of what you think and what you believe and what you perceive. Uh, example, Emotions do not just generate from somewhere in your system. Emotions are a product of the way you think. So you can think yourself into a depression. You can think yourself into happiness. You can think yourself into all kinds of states. So you can think yourself out of being compulsively addicted to a substance. I think the 12 steps are probably where the largest track record is. Uh, I know a lot of society is, let's lock them up. Let's just lock them up. It's useless to put an addict in jail most of the time. If they dry out and see the light, it's a rare thing. And when you say inpatient substance abuse treatment, that's a hospital setting, medically managed detox sort of stuff. Uh, and uh, those are folks who are physiologically dependent. You know, they need the drug to maintain homeostasis. Their body is truly out of balance. The people that think they're in alcohol treatment, but the people that are actually in need of alcohol treatment, they don't really get any of those services. You've got to be able to individualize services to meet the specific needs of the person that's in front of the, uh, the clinician. And I think everybody that's addicted needs to use whatever they can that will work for them. We actually encourage uh, our clients to go to self-help groups because of the support they get but we also warn them not to substitute one addiction for another. Our experience is that people get addicted to AA. As they sell the idea, you will never be cured, you will always be an addict, and so you better go to AA the rest of your life. Well, to the working professional, that's a worse addiction than probably the substance was. I've never seen anybody go to three meetings a week, and then need four meetings a week, and then need five meetings a week, and then need six meetings a week, they need seven meetings a week to get their dose. He was going to AA meetings just compulsively nonstop. Um, 
he got addicted to Reese's peanut butter cups. I mean, bags and bags of Reese's peanut butter cups. Then it became Diet Coke. Um, and I mean, we couldn't just have a 12 pack of Diet Coke. We had the whole friggin' pantry is full of Diet Coke because he might run out. And then it went to um, Hall's cough drops. He's t I, he, he goes nuts now if he doesn't have his Hall's cough drops. Some people talk about healthy addictions, you know, usually in the literature that's stuff like exercise or um, meditation or yoga or something because, you know, a lot of people feel like those things are less damaging and they may, well, they probably are. They'll give up um, alcohol, they'll turn to food, they'll turn to chocolate and sugar. They'll give up chocolate and sugar, they'll turn to smoking pot, whatever. It's, again, it's just like the alcohol addiction, but it's transferred to other things and even the cough drops. We finally talked him into sugar-free cough drops so that I never, I don't understand it though. And that's, you know, again, I think it's because if you understood it, you would have that same addiction, so. The addictive personality is a controversial issue. I don't, personally, I don't believe in it. Addiction is a funny little thing, right? You know, you turn in one addiction for another. I tell my students that we're all users and we may not use drugs but we use all kinds of things we use people and we use food and we use sex we use things i just think we're all addicts i don't know how you feel but everybody i know has addiction or and potential to addiction in, in different areas in their life and so i think it's partly what it is to be human we're sensation seeking creatures and we would find something to get high on you know, even if we're holding our breath for too long. Uh, I mean, what do we call drugs now? Pot, cocaine, uh, hallucinogens, they all do the same in different ways. And, uh, you know, for most people, alcohol seems to be a disinhibitor, right? So um, that's a major consciousness changer, you know, that I, if I'm angry inside myself, but I don't let it out, all of a sudden I'm an angry drunk. To me, that's a major shift to um, induced by a drug. When I say drug, I don't have a connotation like that's necessarily good or bad or right or wrong, but I think we ought to call it what it is. Alcohol is definitely a drug. It satisfies all the criteria for drugs. We define drugs as substances that alter the function or structure of the body. Because it's been made illegal. I think that's the only thing that separates it. Social our cultural biases and things have made it such that it is legal. And I think there are a number of people who can drink and do it safely and a number of people who cannot. And that's the Russian roulette that people play with themselves when they do start drinking. This is what started in America, that's why it's legal. Do you think that if they didn't tax cocaine or whatever, that the government would keep it illegal? Uh, our experience in America is that we tried to make alcohol illegal one time and created the biggest crime syndicates in the world. So we don't want the social consequences of trying that again. Um, I just think that people need to recognize that, you know, if you're going to make some drugs legal, it's, it's kind of, you know, why then are other drugs illegal? Like what people, um, Mark Twain said, if you, if you want to understand a people, this will be my last thought, uh, look at, their, by, their, by their amusements, know them. <laughs> you know, so like, what do people in the United States do for fun? You know, like, and, and I'm not saying it doesn't feel good to drink, of course it does, you know, for most of us. And I'm, I'm not moralizing about that at all. You know, I mean, if, you know, but, but I mean, the way we have fun looks kind of weird. And when I step back from it, I don't know how it looks to you, you know, and, and so, Alcohol is just a symptom, I think, of a whole bunch of other things that are going on in our world that would be cool if we took a more radical approach to it and looked at it. Maybe, maybe we'll have some, um, a shift in that. If the Soviet Union could end, uh, you know, nonviolently, and does, you know, because a lot of us never thought that would ever happen, certainly we could deal with alcohol, right? Hi, my name is John and I will be your narrator for the rest of the film. Okay, so that was a lot of information. And in case you missed any of it, I'll take the next three seconds to give a short recap. There, I hope that helped. So with all we've heard, what does it mean for you? 
Are you an alcoholic? Statistically speaking, probably not. So, are you an addict of some kind? My guess is yes. It might be coffee, or sugar, or alcohol. But it might be shopping, or cigarettes, soda, work, junk food, religion, gambling, pills, people, sports, computers, relationships, pornography, charity, perfection, music, money, fear, support, support groups, crime, 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 pride, pride extra games. games. What is it that you use? Is it harmful or helpful? Beard.